<laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Tomlinson. I've been a part of Greenbelt, a contributor here for more years than I can imagine, really. I've been a, a, a speaker here very often, hope I will be in the future. Uh, I'm currently a trustee of this wonderful event. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here with you this evening and even more delighted to introduce this wonderful man here to you, Rotomy, who you may not be, uh, you may be surprised to know, I actually married 19 years ago this weekend. I mean, not that he's my husband or anything. Uh, I conducted the, his wedding to the lovely Zalika over there. 19 years ago, I actually left Greenbelt for a little while, shot back there to take their wedding and then came back and uh, also had uh, the great pleasure of baptizing their, their lovely daughter, Leah. So, uh, Rotomy is familiar to me. It was part of the congregation that I, I led for a long time. Right. So, uh, I think that Rotomy, I mean, he certainly was always an extremely popular member of our congregation, a very personable man uh, who very quickly not only uh, was received as a lovely, warm, friendly person, but as someone that people really respected. And I think that respect has grown over the years as, uh, as he has evolved and grown within himself and, uh, and within his work. So, we're kind of, uh, and, and I should say, I do have a copy of his book here, which I may mention again at the end, but it's called This, could, this Book Could Help You, which is a great title, really. wish I'd written that. Uh, <laughs> the Men's Headspace Manual. It's definitely the kind of book that I like to read, really, because it's got lots of big print and some illustrations and lots of bite-sized stuff. It's very, very practical, uh, a real manual. And incidentally, all the... Uh, the, the uh, takings of it go to the charity Mine for Better Mental Health. So uh, all in a good cause too. Very wonderful. So uh, basically the form of this evening is, is me and my friend here having a bit of a conversation which we invite you to, to be a part of. So we'll definitely come to a point where we'll open it to everyone. But that said, uh, certainly I am a very spontaneous kind of person. So if you, uh, if you have something that you really, really want to ask, then I'll be looking around to see if you put your hand up. We can, we can do that along the way. Okay. So, Rosamie, you've been in this tent already I in have. the session. Yeah. Uh, but this one's focusing more particularly on you yeah. and, and your work, really. Which feels a bit weird, but anyway, go on. <laughs> You'll get used to it. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your work, and, and how you, you came to be involved in this particular area of, of your profession. Okay, so in the previous session I explained that I'm a therapeutic counsellor and have been for over 20 years now. Um, and when people ask me that question, it's quite strange. It's almost by accident, even though in some ways I, I don't believe in accidents. Um, I had never really intended to be a, a counsellor. Um, I do remember saying to my mother many many years ago that I'd like to do something in the helping professions and I, I explain in the book that she had suggested that I wouldn't be able to become rich in the <laughs> helping professions why don't I go into law or be a doctor um, so I was thinking about it in some ways but certainly not thinking about a therapeutic counsellor it was only I mean strange thing is and I'll tell you a little bit about my story um, parents came from Nigeria in the um, late 50s, part of the Windrush generation, but they came from West Africa, and I think the name of the ship was the Aurora or something, um, and had four children, had a tumultuous relationship. They separated, so my mother brought us up on her own for so many years. Um, and you can imagine the challenges of bringing up uh, children on your own in the 60s as well. Um, we were all very, very well behaved, but we weren't attuned, or I certainly wasn't, to, to education. And I didn't do very well at school, as it happened. Um, but in those days, you can leave school and find yourself a job and work and get experience. And I just worked in youth centres and in children's homes and built up some experience doing that. And strangely enough, I uh, went to Manchester to do an access course into higher education, came back. And um, there was a job at um, uh, a polytechnic in South East London that was just transferring into a university that was looking for a welfare advisor in the students' union using counselling skills. And I thought, I use counselling skills in the job that I do, working with children in children's homes, so I could do that job. Applied, got it, very surprised that I did. Started working full-time within a year, took the management job, job in the role in the year after that. 
Um, and then um, they developed a new master's in therapeutic counselling. And I thought, well, here's my opportunity to get myself a formal qualification and decided to embark on that and did. And it was around the same time we actually joined yeah, yeah. St. Luke's, yeah, actually, right. in, the, in the late 90s, which is when I met you for the first time. And um, took that, got the diploma, became a counsellor and did the masters afterwards. And it was just strange the way that it happened. But I remember that I wanted to do a thesis on how to help minority groups in particular to access counselling and psychotherapy. Because what I found then, and it's still the case now, is that counselling and psychotherapy is still the domain, if you like, of the white middle classes, unfortunately. Um, and I knew then that I wanted to do something about encouraging the minority groups to be thinking differently about their own mental health and to perhaps access mental health as professionals or to seek support. So in a way, I've been on a mission since then to do something about having uh, minority groups access um, counselling and psychotherapy in this country. I have a particular focus on working with men and black men because I think black men have more than their fair share of not just mental health concerns, but all sorts of concerns. You know, if you're at school as a black boy, you're more likely to be evicted from school in primary school or get to secondary school, it'll be the same, or you'll leave with a few qualifications or drop out of university if you get into university or come out of university with, you know, very low grades. Or, and if you come out with good grades, you're still unlikely to get a job compared to your white counterpart. So something's going on in society anyway when it comes to being a black man. And I wanted to be able to, in some ways, help do something about that and with black men about that. In writing this book in particular, though, what I also was what I wanted to do was to, in some ways, engage more So if, if we just, just one more... If we am just I going stick too a, fast? No, no, no. I just wanted to stick a pin in that issue that you're talking about, yes, about the focus on black men. OK. Uh, so what has your experience been then? Have you found that, that those people that you've targeted uh, have been... Uh, open to intervention from, from the point of view of, of, of counselling and so on? I mean, how, have you found resistance to that or discomfort or, mm. or how has it been? Yeah, yeah, certainly resistance and discomfort. Um, I mean, what triggered me into organising various projects about this was when I did my dissertation and my research with black men in counselling or black men in higher education who were not accessing counselling and support services at the same weight as the um, white counterparts. And they were like, well, I don't trust the mental health services or I don't trust the support services because they don't know anything about me as a black man. It's white, it's Eurocentric, it's like to be racist. I can't see any black counselors there. Why would I want to attend? So yeah, all of these things, really. And it's the same sort of issues and concerns that they have about accessing physical health services um, or various professions, that there are people not in those places like me, and I'm not encouraged to go and seek support in those places or get a job in those places. And so that has been the constant, the constant battle, really. For those but in but by virtue of you being a black person in, in that role, I mean, ha has that made a difference, would you say? I mean, have you, have you found greater reception on the part of, of black men? I, I certainly hope so. Um, it hasn't been easy... I mean, you know, uh, there were only two black men on the course that I took part in back then. Um, being a manager in higher education at the moment, invariably, I, I don't know any other person working at my level across the higher education sector who happens to be a black man. There isn't. Wow, really? At all, in this country, in this day and age. It's unbelievable. But the same is to be said also as well about... Well, churches. I mean, I came to St. Luke's. It was, at the time, predominantly white, yeah. uh, predominantly middle classes. I've made some fantastic friends in that church, by the way. So, But nevertheless, it was that then, and probably to some extent now. And I find that in many churches which we you know, partake in and visit now. So in many parts of society, there is that challenge anyway. I mean, sometimes you know, black men like myself might feel unwelcome or know that they're in for a battle, actually. And I've found that I've had to persevere find allies who are willing to support and offer their advice and be prepared to do that with people who aren't like me, actually. Um, and also as well be prepared to 
yeah, make some sacrifices also as well. I mean, it's been a long, hard slug and, and battle, but I hope by doing that and by representing that people will also as well see me maybe as a mentor or someone that they could look up to. And, I've, and people have come up to me and told me that that has been the case. So it's been good. But I still, after so many years, find myself being a pioneer, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So before I interrupted you, you were going to say about your book? Uh, yeah, so the book isn't about a particular race of men. It's about men in general. Um, I mean, we all know it, and I know I'm going to be preaching to the converted when I say that men don't talk about their emotions. We just don't. I mean, the vast majority of men in my family and men outside my family and men who I meet won't talk about their emotions and their concerns. And, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that we don't do that, then we're on a crash course to massive problems, mental and physical. I mean, I was mentioning in the previous session about prostate cancer, a massive killer of men. Um, not as massive as suicide, as it happens. But these are two things which, with early intervention, could reduce the numbers of men who are suffering from prostate cancer or who are thinking about killing themselves. I mean, you know, the NHS has got some good services to help men who have got all sorts of cancers. Get in there and get some support and some help. There are a plethora of services available to support men with their mental health. And you don't necessarily have to use the mental health system <laughs> to manage your own mental mm. health. You know, talk to your friends, your brothers, your family, your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend. Um, just talk. Mm. But more men, as yet, aren't willing to do that. So, I thought, just like I did when I started projects to work with um, minority groups, I thought with this book, it was, in a way, the most simplistic way to get the message across to men. It's not a... a psychotherapeutic or psychological tome. It really is just a simple guide, practical um, guide to look after your own mental health. Like you say, lots of pictures, big texts, mm. lots of quotes from lots of celebrities and some very, very ordinary men talking about how they've managed their own, their own mental health. I mean, when I was working with MOM Books and with Mind the Charity, they were brilliant, you know, in thinking about the size of the book, the colours, you know. You've got to think about a book that men are happy to open on the tube or can slip into their back pocket, all of those sorts of things. The advice was brilliant, but it really is a book, hopefully, that men could pick up and think about mental health in their own way. I mean, most of the books that are about mental health for men are by celebrities who talk about their own mental health experience, but minds tell me that this is the first time they think that there's been a practical guide. So I, yeah, I was yeah, very, very interested in doing something so like do, that. So do suicide rates, are, are, they, are they greater amongst men than women? Uh, yes, yes, actual successful, if you want to call it successful, suicide rates, absolutely. And, you know, the surprising fact of statistics in the last five, um, last five years or so is that the age has got higher and higher. So we're talking, really? yeah. yes, particularly men 40 upwards, actually, between 40 and 65. There's an increase in numbers who are actively committing suicide, unfortunately. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons for why that might be and why men might um, be more successful. If you, successful's not the right word, but I think you know <laughs> what I mean. Um, who are committing suicide more than women. I mean, they're more likely to take very drastic action when it comes to that, you know, if it's not jumping off buildings, jumping into the river, or taking pills, or causing serious harm, which they can't come back from, men are probably more likely to do that, and are likely to be more, you know, likely to, mm. to, to kill themselves in relation to that. So, uh, I mean, are there, are there I, I mean, from your experience, are there identifiable causes of that, of what, of, you know, what are the things that bring a man, say, to that particular point? multitude of things. I wish I had the answer, really, but there's a multitude of things. I mean, I mentioned a couple in the book. Um, we live in a man's world. We all know this, right? Uh, we live in a man wo man's world that's patri patriarchal and sexist. But nevertheless, there is a huge pressure on men to be men, whatever that means. I mean, you know, for men in relationships, how many times are we told, you know, to man up or be a man? Um, or like, you know, you've got depression, kick depression in the balls, all those sorts of things, really. And in, its, in, in a way, it's a pressure. If we don't fit that standard, if we aren't providing for our families, if we aren't in leadership positions, 
if we fail at doing something that we're expected to not fail in, then yeah, that's going to cause some kind of a cognitive dissonance, I think. And men are going to take drastic action mm. if they don't understand that necessarily what they're doing is they're buying into something that really isn't real or is them. So yeah, men do have their peculiar pressures. And sometimes it's hard to convince people of this because we live in a man's world. But the fact of the matter is that we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the high level of suicide rates and the high level of mental health concerns and even physical concerns for, for men. Something is going on yeah. that men aren't able to manage or to handle. And that might not be about men per se, it might be about society actually as it happens and what society's expectations of, uh, of men are. So, I mean, we're obviously aware of the, the kind of high profile, profile interventions from, from, the, from the princes, William and Harry, talking mm. about mental health. Um, you know, there's been the podcasts, um, Peter, what's his name, footballer? Peter Crouch, that's Peter Crouch. thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Senior moment. Yes. Um, <laughs> Peter Crouch is, you know, I mean, I listened to that amazing conversation oh, there yeah. amongst them. Uh, do you, would your perception be that things are getting better for men in terms of talking about their emotional needs and, and those sort of issues? Um, it's like anything. Slowly but surely, yeah, things are changing. I mean, I think there's a, still a massive stigma around mental health, and particularly for men, it's massive, and people aren't sharing their own mental health concerns because they imagine that they will be treated badly or discriminated against because they have a mental health condition. And so, yeah, that's, that's a massive, massive thing to change. More and more people are talking about it, which is absolutely brilliant. So see, see the princes do it, I think it's awesome. I mean, they've got the resources. They can make a massive amount of change. And the fact that they got a number of footballers together to talk about this a few months ago, I think is brilliant because so many men follow football and they might think very, very different about their own mental health. I do have a slight concern that what might happen with the focus on men's health in particular is that it might go one way still. You know, all the resources then into mental health will all of a sudden just be going to men and will probably just be going to white men as it happens. Mm. So we have to be careful about how we manage that. But in answer to your question, I think that yes, there is more of a profile, more of an exposure, more of a, an interest in the importance of mental health and the impact that that has on the individual, on the community and on society mm. in general. And the more we understand the importance of that, the more people will be open to managing those sorts of things. I mean, you've heard it before. If we can think about mental health in the same way that we do physical health, we'll be halfway to resolving a hell of a lot of problems, actually. A yeah. Hell of a lot. Well, so, yeah, there's more openness. And, I, and I suppose, really, it, it is a... Uh, well, I think it's a positive thing that we talk about mental health, you know, that rather than simply talking about mental illness. Mm. So, because so, that kind of, you know, is a, carries a stigma in itself that, that makes it harder for people to perhaps talk about or face up to. But, but the thought that, in a way, we all can have mental health problems at different points in our lives and that mental health is putting the focus not so much necessarily on dealing with the ailments and the things that are going wrong, but, but maintaining mental health, maintain, as you say, like physical. That, that's got to be a kind of a step forward, really, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely, that we all have mental health, actually, rather than mental illness. Yeah, yeah. And, how you manage mental health and how you um, manage the triggers and the mental illness and the depression or the anxiety that you have in life is a thing that's going to make a significant difference. Uh, important, you know, just at a very low level for people to acknowledge and understand that we all suffer from stress. We all do. Some of us have a stronger capacity to do it. We've got communities that are very supportive and some of us are just very, very vulnerable and we need that additional support. But part of trying to be able to do something about that and think about that differently is for us to understand that really there is only just one health which is about physical and mental health and we need to treat them the same right. and help people to know and understand from day one that they are yeah, the same yeah. should be treated differently yeah. and similarly I suppose really I mean as, as kind of a as, as a clergy person and someone who's been involved with churches and church leadership for most of my adult life um, I think I, I've grown in the belief that religion can be quite a big source of mental disorder. Okay. Um, but I, I don't know if you, if you can recognise that, or I mean, you know, whether in people... Have I recognise lots of mad people in church? So, <laughs> you know. uh, no, I think we all know that, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, I suppose really, I mean, I, I, I actually flew away from, I say flew, I mean in a car, from Greenbelt 
this morning down to London to, to do Pause for Thought on Radio 2. And, uh, and I was talking about kind of, well, it's a kind of bank holiday talk, you know, about the sort of thing of one of the things that we do and that my wife makes me do, really, is to declutter and go to the, the tip on holidays and get rid of your stuff. And so I was doing that to talk about how we need to declutter mentally. Yeah. And, and I said, I realised that probably quite, quite a lot of my job, really, as a priest, I suppose, has been about helping people to declutter. Mm -hmm. And I would say one of the major things, probably the number one item that I have helped people to, to take to the dump mentally would be guilt. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, religion, you can think, I mean, you know, grace, which we heard about on Sunday morning, is all about lifting guilt and saying, you know, that this unconditional acceptance. But it is the case, isn't it, that an awful lot of, of religion does, in fact, lead to, to the increase of guilt in people, really. I think it's definitely possible. I, I think not just the increase in guilt, the possible increase in mental health concerns as well. Right. I mean, in a strange kind of way, and I don't know if I've ever said this to you before, uh, one of the things that attracted me to St. Luke's at the time that you know, me and my family were going there is because St. Luke's presented itself as a very non-traditional church. It was the strangest thing for us to come across. I mean, you know, I've been going to church you know, ever since I can remember, and I remember when my family stopped and I still continued, but these were very still, in the Church of England, very staid and traditional and white and all hymns, and one particular way of doing things, which in some ways didn't really resonate from me and my own particular background. When I got to St. Luke's, I found that they were a little more, liberal is probably the wrong word, but I remember very much at the time that you would encourage members of the congregation to you know, join you in doing sermons or presenting or doing prayers. Uh, your wife, Pat, was brilliant in asking people to, you know, do the bread and wine and all of that. And it felt much more like a community and a community that could dictate how the church itself could be run and what it would do, which is brilliant rather than being told to do something in a particular way. Doing that, I think, is what necessarily can cause illnesses for people to be thinking that, you know, or to be constrained by a particular way of doing things. So I do think that faith and religion in some contexts has a lot to answer for. I do think it can cause its own problems mm. rather than being the place where you should be able to... Well, at the end of the day, I expect my priest to be a counsellor. You are the first kind of <laughs> counsellor. That is partly your role, a place where I can come and talk to you in confidence and you help me and give me support. But if you're all about, well, you know, forgive me, Catholics, 12 Hail Marys, and, you know, you follow this way of being and follow this way of doing, and that's the way that you'll, you know, save your life, then I think that in itself can have, have some problems. Yeah, so there's I think there's a right. lot of different versions right. of that in other traditions too, really. I yeah, think, absolutely, but, yes. You know, but you're right. But I, th I think, yeah, I'm, I, I definitely believe that churches and, you know, institutional Christianity or, or your mainstream, you know, does have quite a lot to answer for in this respect. I also think it's got massive opportunities, you know, that, that I think that hopefully we are sort of creeping and crawling little by little fingernails along the ground to redefine the role and place of women in the context of a church okay. community. And, and things are changing, um, some, sometimes more than in others. Uh, and that's, that's where we've had a lot of, lots of us have had a lot of folks on wanting to facilitate that. But I think also, I'd like to see that church is a place where the role of men within life and society generally could, could be redefined. In other words, that, that, that churches, church communities can be places of kind of refuge from that macho, strong man you know, man up sort of mentality and be a place where vulnerability can be touched and experienced mm. and more tender or more vulnerable emotions can come to the mm, fore. Mm, mm, mm. Wouldn't would you think? I would love to see that happen. I would really love to see that happen. <laughs> I think so. And part of that would be, I mean, I would hope it would be mirrored in society at some point, but part of that would be about encouraging men to, yes, be vulnerable. And that might mean opening up the church to women to lead, which means that men will automatically be in a vulnerable position because yeah, they're just not points, being leaders anymore. I yeah. think that that would be truly significant. I mean, at the end of the day, part of the healing is about putting yourself in a vulnerable place and managing and dealing with that. 
But I think churches and faith and religion have a significant part to play in society, a critical one, actually, I think. I mean, you know, back in the day, me and my friends used to talk about the liberation theology of the um, South Americas and various other places and the difference it made to people's thinking and behavior and acting in their own societies. Why can't church do more of that now? Why can't we really truly believe in church or in our faith or in our religion or in our places of worship that we really are bodies that can make a significant change in society, throughout society? not just in our small communities, and part of that will be helping uh, men to think about redefining themselves and then therefore redefining society. So yeah, yeah I get it completely. Yeah, well, I think sometimes, you know, the, there's the Christian spirituality is, is sometimes perceived of and, and conveyed in terms of, in terms of a kind of man-up sort of spirituality, you know, strong, robust, triumphalistic sort of, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's in God and all that, but actually it comes down to the fact that this is, this is the sort of people that we are, and I uh, and I think that um, that quite a lot of damage at times has been caused by that. Really, mm. I'm going to just pause you for a minute and mm -hmm. just see how everyone's doing here, and if anyone's got any question or comment, and we I can come back to Rotomi if you haven't. But uh, any question you'd like to ask him or point you'd like to make, there's one over there. <laughs> 